SPACs are very much here to stay. You can trade anything as a trend follower. When you think about Bitcoin, I don't think it's a currency, I think it's a commodity. Today, we're in an everything bubble. I'm Eric Schatzker and welcome to Bloomberg's Front Row. Today, I'm talking to the hedge fund hotshots who founded Diameter Capital, Scott Goodwin and Jonathan Lewinson. They invest in credit, everything from investment grade to distressed, making bets on whether borrowers will or won't repay their debts. Diameter is a new breed of hedge fund built for modern markets where speed is the difference between winning and losing. If you look at how Tiger's disrupting venture with frankly speed of capital, or what's happening with Alrock disrupting uh, private credit at speed of capital. Speed of capital is really what matters. You don't have time anymore in an environment to sit for weeks and think about it. Diameter is growing fast too, from zero to $9 billion in just four years. Scott, Jonathan, and I discuss why they're returning some hedge fund capital to clients, how they've produced some of the best returns in credit, a business plan that gets diameter to $30 billion. The key themes behind their trades, including ESG. Here's my conversation with Scott Goodwin and Jonathan Lewinson. You guys have built one of the hottest hedge fund businesses on the planet, and you've done it in credit, right? At a time of historically low yields, fleeting distress, zombie borrowers, all in the space of four years. How? Well, um, I guess that goes back to 2010 uh, when we first met uh, at, at Anchorage Capital. We worked together um, beneath uh, Tony Davis and Kevin Ulrich and Dan Allen, who ran the firm. Um, John's background is in research and restructuring, mine's in risk and trading. I think we quickly realized working together uh, that that combination of risk and trading and research and restructuring worked really well together versus his background in research and my background at Solomon City in just trading and risk. Um, it was very powerful and, and eventually we got to the point where we thought we could do our own thing. Um, he had a little interlude at a different firm, um, but when I left Anchorage in 2016, we were ready to do it. What we learned day one is we have very different skills and we're in an environment where more and more everyone wants to say, you just do this, you do a narrow thing. And what Scott and I love to do is we love to look across the entire credit spectrum from investment grade to new issues, stress and distress. And I come from a place where we tend to do lots of deep value work, thinking about restructuring. Scott came from a place where maybe you held positions shorter. And we realized that, and this is the pitch to investors that got us in business, that there weren't many firms, there are many great firms that do aspects of this, but there weren't a lot of firms that were offering investors a investment in credit. Some years it's investment grade, sometimes it's new issue, other times it's shorting, other times it's restructuring and taking over companies in one package that was large enough to be relevant to banks and advisors, but also small enough to be nimble. And that trading and research, by the way, the personalities don't always work. Sometimes traders and analysts don't like each other. We like each yeah. other. Uh, I think our pants are even the same color <laughs> today. Um, that was a key part of it, but offering that trading and research together um, has allowed us to not only pitch something that worked to LPs, but then make it a reality. If I had gone to your clients, whether they're institutions, whether they're high net worth people, whatever, back in 2017 and asked them what they thought, I know what they would have told me. They would have said, the last thing the world needs is another credit hedge fund. Yeah, yeah. they did. In fact, the joke we made was the world would rather have, a, uh, I think, yeah. a global epidemic, we said, than a credit hedge fund. So we, we, we should probably retire that <laughs> now. Um, but yeah, it was, but that's what kind of made it work. What we're doing is a little bit of a throwback. We believe that there are inefficiencies in markets, in trading, and that if you are able to be native across these markets, you'll be able to more quickly understand where the dislocations are. And so uh, in pitching that a little bit of a throwback and pitching a hedge fund, which in many ways was a dirty word, today we, you know, we manage a number of different products, but saying we're going to do that, we're gonna provide you something that is not as volatile as the markets um, and that is more smooth and in down markets, hopefully we do well, um, was something they hadn't heard in a while and uh, we're lucky that some people took a chance. Maybe we're a little bit more proactive and aggressive in terms of getting research done ahead of events versus reacting to the event and doing the research after the event. But it's combining that trading and research with speed, which we think speed is really alpha in credit. You have a discontinuous market structure. So how do you engage in a discontinuous market structure with speed? You have to know a lot of names. So we have a 20 person analyst team here that many of whom have worked with us pre previously that help us know a lot of names. And if we know a lot of names and we combine the risk and portfolio management functions, which is what we've done and that I do a lot of the trading as well, 
then we can react quickly when a mutual fund needs to sell a block of bonds. Because Fidelity or BlackRock or PIMCO, the big mutual fund complexes, when they're, if they might have an outflow and they want to sell, the banks are no longer bidding on a couple hundred million bonds. They're calling us or maybe one or two other counterparties that can react in five minutes because we have a proactive process where the research is done up front and we know the names, we can respond in seconds. We don't have to go through the junior trader, then the senior trader, then the junior analyst, then the senior analyst, the junior PM, the senior PM, layers and layers and layers and layers and layers are frankly bullshit, pardon my French, um, to make that decision. We Look, can make it fast. This is a new firm. We only started investing on September 1st, 2017. We have the benefit of taking our skill set and our team skill set and kind of molding it for the current environment, for the current state of credit markets, for the post Volcker world, um, and for the world now post COVID. Um, part of what we think separates us from many of our competitors, even though many of them are great, is this combination of knowledge and speed. Speed of capital is really what matters. You don't have time anymore in an environment to sit for weeks and think about it. And you know, in some degrees, you see private equity firms oftentimes wanting to get into credit when it's interesting. But their cultures are set up to be slow because they swing infrequently and it doesn't always work. We've set up a culture that says, do your work ahead of time. Have a huge amount of work in the preparedness and less amount of process in the decision making. And that we think works with our skills, but also is designed for today's markets and really builds on what we've learned from many people uh, who have come before us. If you look at how Tiger's disrupting venture with frankly speed of capital, or what's happening with Alrock disrupting uh, private credit at speed of capital. So all these markets that have discontinuous liquidity, speed of capital matters because most people provide slower capital. If you can provide speed of capital with knowledge, not just provide speed of capital without the research, then you can have an advantage in an environment that's highly competitive. Now you're returning some of your capital to clients and you're raising fees. How come? So we'd always size constrain it with close multiple times. We were actually closed when COVID started and we reopened and took money in. Um, but now we're going to return about 10% of the capital um, at the end of the year, uh, which will bring the fund to, into the five and change billion range from the mid sixes. Um, and we think that that sets us up to, to grow into that capital base again. And if it happens again in the year where the market environment hasn't changed, we'll return capital again. We want to size capital to maximize returns on a risk adjusted basis. That's something we've committed to our day one LPs. And in terms of the fees, we want to be competitive. We need a lot of people to run our strategy. And we're competing with people who have, frankly, much larger businesses. Our business, certain of our strategies just don't work if, you're, if you have to make massive investments all the time. And this idea, we want people to think about diameter. We want you to think about big enough to be relevant, small enough to be nimble. And the second we feel that that nimbleness is compromised, we're not running the strategy that we want to run. It becomes someone else's strategy. And frankly, we wouldn't be as good at it. We have tests that we use. And like anything, it's quantitative and qualitative. Can we move 1% position uh, quickly, long and short? Can we, you know, partnering with banks and issuers on new issue is an important part of our business that we can get into. Can we, we don't like using leverage, and so we like doing a lot of new issue in bull markets. Can we get enough of that uh, for the fund size? I look at the hedge fund highway, mm -hmm. and I see a lot of burned out wrecks. Mm -hmm. Whose failures did you learn from? I think it's less about about other people's failures and just observing markets in general. But at Citigroup, for, for me, right, and, and you know, this is very public that, that Sowood blew up in 2007, they were one of our biggest clients. And they were probably you know, 90 to 1 levered on, on LCDS, which is derivative product on levered loans, versus an unsecured short base. And that trade might have worked if they could hold it. The levered loan market went down maybe two points in the middle of 2007, they were out of business. So that taught me a lot about leverage and using total return and trading to generate returns instead of using a lot of leverage. So I learned from that. The most important thing we've taken from seeing failures elsewhere or, la or, or periods of failure amid successes is getting sizing wrong. When you, you know, people want to be really relevant. I'm the biggest creditor. I own 20, I'm in control of this process. And that's great if it works. If it doesn't work, you're stuck and you can't change your mind. And this notion of always being the biggest we think really doesn't work for you if you're investing in companies that aren't necessarily the best companies in the world. When a company's going through a restructuring, it means there's a problem. There's a reason why it's called the junk bond market. <laughs> yeah. It's not the high grade market. And God knows we've so. made so many underwriting mistakes. We've owned things that have been, we've bought them at or above par and recover pennies on the dollar. And we've exited them, you know, down five points, seven points, 10 points, because we saw the smoke. We have a culture that treats smoke as fire, takes it seriously. I really credit Scott with a lot of that. 
And then we are of a position size to be able to sell. And so that really obsessing over downside in our sizing, as opposed to wanting a very, very concentrated book, differentiates our portfolio management strategy. Selling fast when there's something wrong, and that's, again, something I've learned from mentors on the risk side in the past, I don't think is under, very well understood outside of diameter how many losses that saved us. In some cases, people think we're shorting something. We're getting out of a long that we, yeah. we got wrong. Right? We're not, we don't cost trade. You know, I, we think about what the risk is worth today, tomorrow, six months in the future, a year in the future. We're never focused on what it was worth yesterday. And that's really a really important part of our DNA in that we will sell fast because we'll, and we'll buy it back. We're not at a size. We don't want to be at a size where we need capital markets events to exit ma the majority of our book. Yeah. It feels to me when you talk about this like you're actually reliving the experience. Yeah, What's a good I mean, example of getting out before you know, the house burned down? Oh, uh, McDermott. McDermott. I mean, uh. McDermott, we got so wrong. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we really, it's a business uh, that uh, did underwater cables for or underwater pipes, for lack of, to simply explain it, to taking oil from offshore back onshore. And it was a very well-managed business in an industry that is secularly challenged because let's say uh, there's been, since the crash in oil in 14 and 15. And they were buying a company that did um, similar things in terms of contracting and building outside of oil and gas. And so our view was, if you take the great management team from McDermott and combine it with this company that maybe not well managed, frankly, but has good secular and building, say, petrochemical plants, you have a really nice combination. Um, we saw, and so we participated, it was a tough new issue deal. It's a hung deal. I, I, I think, I think uh, Barclays was the bank, it was a hung deal. We helped them with that hung Firstly, deal. Firstly, and unsecured, God help yeah. us. And, and right away, I would say a quarter into it, it traded up originally, we made four points, we were high-fiving, we was were happy. It was up a lot, we made a lot. It was probably up, I think, on the, new, on the unsecured, it went up as much as 10, and the secured five or six. We got out of a lot of it. We still own some. We own, we own some, and yeah. then we saw on a management, on a quarterly call, the numbers weren't great. And we got the sense that the management team didn't really know what they bought. By the way, it was complicated what they bought. These companies, uh, these ENCs that build these, these, these massive facilities, the cash flows in and out are very hard to model. And we said, wow, if the whole thesis is about good management team taking this over, if they're having trouble projecting cash flow, what are we gonna do? And the bonds were down, you know, I would say low 90s. Yeah, we sold the bonds in the low 90s and the loan, I think, at 97 or 98, and we were out. We should have shorted it. And um, the bonds went to two. So hindsight, <laughs> hindsight, we should have shorted it, and that's our big miss. Yes. But and that's getting out fast, we want to get out fast, and then we're annoyed that we didn't short it. Yeah. But, and there's other stories like that. It's about, you know, there's, there's a Seinfeld episode where George is at his uh, girlfriend's kid's birthday party, and he, there's a small smoke fire from the kitchen, and he knocks the women and children down uh, to get out. Uh, I think we're a little more genteel, but uh, we, we think about that story That's not infrequently. Yeah. What about the flip side to failure? Who are your superheroes? I was lucky enough to grow up around finance a bit. Uh, my dad was an investment banker, and I had exposure to Tony James, uh, John McFarlane, uh, Richard Chilton. These are guys who shaped my view of what I should be doing very young. I went not, to, not to mention the modern Wall right. Street. He grew and up on the right side of the tracks. I went, I went to Duke knowing that I wanted to be a trader, doing hedge funds, reading Liar's Poker. And I showed up at Solomon City and they said, well, you're not good enough at math for the mortgage desk. Try the junk bond desk, where I worked for Jim Zelter, who now runs Apollo Credit Globe. I think he's, I think he's the president of Apollo. And he's been a, not only a mentor, but a partner for us at Diameter, a great partner, and helping us build some of our businesses. Um, and you know, there, there are others who have been helpful, but I would certainly highlight those. It's not only business. I mean, I clerked for Richard Posner on the US Court of Appeals, who's this amazing legendary judge. And everyone had these, you know, or he, he asked us to call him by his first name because he wanted us to talk truth to him. He didn't want us to be intimidated by him. And he was the most intimidating guy, frankly, any of us had come in contact with. You know, he was the judge of his generation. And learning that from, for, from an early age, it's the culture here. People come at us so hard, and that's what we want. And, and that's it, what we learned. Some people I know are baffled by your returns. Hmm. They say there's nowhere near enough ways in credit today to generate that much alpha, especially running as little leverage as you do. So what's the secret? How does, how does the magic happen? So, I mean, it's, it's knowing the names first, right? A you lot really of believe who, that that is, well, that's a dividing line between you and others. Can, everybody can know the names, mm -hmm. okay? But no, not everyone does. But knowing them early and knowing a lot of them versus knowing them after they go down. Think about it. Most of credit is rules-based. 
You have investors who either have a ratings constraint, a duration constraint, or a liquidity constraint. Mutual funds, for example. Mutual funds, others, CLOs, right? Mm -hmm. We manage CLOs, they have tons of constraints on them, and we, we abide by all those constraints. But if you have a, a universe of names you know, and then you can apply that to all markets, investment grade, levered loans, high yield, stress, distress, structured credit, at any given time, in 2011, it was Meredith Whitney blowing up the muni market, right? And be agnostic to where you go on a risk-adjusted basis and be fast because you have a trading mentality that is in your portfolio management process. That's what differentiates it. And it's, it's in, this, in this environment, like people, now they're gonna, people are gonna say again, there's nothing to do in credit, right? Diameters returning capital, but there is stuff to do. We just think we wanna size our core hedge fund product to do it well. What is there to do right now? Well, you had a pandemic, huge recession. A lot of companies did very poorly for six to 12 months. Now they're doing well. Some are having record earnings. Enterprise values are higher than they were pre-COVID. Those companies that were junked are going back to investment grade. There's an ARB because when you go from double B to triple B, the number of buyers in the universe expands exponentially. So if you own the company as double B and you think that S&P or Moody's is gonna upgrade it, like Netflix is a position for us right now that we think will get upgraded, there are gonna be more buyers of Netflix and those bonds will tighten. And maybe that isn't a money ball to opportunity, but it's a high sharp, high IRR opportunity. <laughs> capital markets, there's record M&A right now. We have capital markets bankers calling us, asking to lay off risk because they want to do more deals. So A, we can help them lay off that risk. We can participate in those deals, learn new names. Those are the opportunities and, and credit dispersion was record lows first half of the year. Now it's starting to come back. You looked skeptically when we said, know the names. Why can't everyone know the names? It's an efficient market. You can't, think tanks don't work in finance. By the way, I don't know that they work that well in Washington, but that's again another story. Think tanks don't work here. So if you don't have a mandate to buy investment grade bonds or to buy new issue high yield bonds, you are not going to know them. If you don't have a mandate that includes shorting businesses occasionally, you're not gonna know businesses that are in the decline. So when the crisis hits, whether it's oil and gas collapsing in 2014 or 15, or it's even at the end of 18, you know, when there was a scare on interest rates and the market sold off, or of course the global pandemic that we went through. If you are now, if you haven't invested in the names previously, you're not gonna do it again, because what do people do? When you are afraid, when the market sells down, unless you're a total cycle, unless you're the guy in free solo whose brain is different than the rest of us, you're gonna be afraid too, right? Because the market is trading off for a real reason. There is a global pandemic. Okay, so you're not gonna buy something you've never heard of. You're gonna go back to what you know. But if you've only been looking at crappy companies, let's say you were, you're, that, that's your mandate, then you'll buy things that went from 75 to 50. We think oftentimes they go to zero. So it's our mandate of always looking at a lot of things, not having a think tank, always finding ways to invest in it with one team that allows us to constantly find what Scott talked about, the return available in credit. Is the old distress model broken? Hmm. If you think about the, the, the basis of the distress debt market, why it existed and why you know people who invented it were so successful it was like the heart of inefficiency you had companies going into big problems the people who owned their securities could no longer own it banks didn't have workout guys insurance companies didn't want to own it forced selling buying at pennies on the dollar cycles that happened frequently and kind of to some degree predictably and then public markets that when you cleaned up these things, you could sell them back to public markets as value, as value stocks. All of those, those pillars are to some degree broken. While there are inefficiencies in distressed, there are far few for sellers than there used to be. CLOs are now active participants in restructurings, in some degree more important than some of the hedge funds. They don't sell nearly as much. Every bank has, you know, has had workout groups for years. They don't want to, they, no one wants to just uh, sell because it's restructuring. And then on top of that, we have a change in cycles. You know, it used to be if you were working at a central bank, if you were leading a central bank, a recession was part of the cycle. Now we think that they're very focused on limiting recessions. Uh, I think they view themselves as you know, guardians of, of the economy and maybe to ward off populism to some degree. And they don't want long recessions. And then on top of that, kind of the worst thing you can own in equity markets is value stocks over the last two decades. How about a value stock that still has some debt on it, that recently filed for bankruptcy, that's owned by a lot of distressed guys who need to sell, that's less liquid. Many investors think of banks as their adversaries. You guys think of bank partners. trading desks as your, ally, your partners, you just said it, right? right? This fascinates me, explain. They know that they can call diameter on names we know well, and they're not getting the junior analyst. They're not getting the junior trader. 
they're getting me or John. Who then needs to report to the junior investment committee, to the senior investment committee, and then to the portfolio yeah. manager. They can get capital decisions quickly, and we'll be just like we're being transparent and direct with you, we're very transparent and direct with them. And we think they're real partners for us. They've helped us. We helped them originate a lot of things, but our business wouldn't be where it is right now without the support of the banks early on. We had some of the, some of the, the, the investment arms of the banks on the asset management side were some of our earliest investors. Because they talk to us every day, because we share our information, during the crisis, during the COVID crisis, every, a few times a day, Scott was going into all our bank counterparties, knowing who their best relationships were in the mutual fund community, letting them know exactly which highly owned mutual fund names we liked. And we were buying software loans in the 70s and 80s, sometimes five points below where they were on the screens. Because they know that they can rely on us for that execution, and we tell them what we like. We got a call from the head of loan trading. It was you know second week of March of 2020, and he said, mutual fund has, an, has close to a billion dollar outflow today. I don't know who it was, but they need to sell 500 million by eight or 9 a.m. And we gave that person, he knew the names we cared on. He said, here's the overlap. One of the names was Infor uh, Lawson, which is a software business we had inv been investing in for Many 10 times. years. The Koch family had an announced deal to buy this business. I think it was four times levered, and they had, were buying it for 14 times. <laughs> and we were able to buy that debt in the, in the low 80s, mid 80s. So that was, in, not only was it money good debt, but there was an announced M&A deal. We bought 100 million of that because we were able to bid at 7 a.m. for half a billion dollars of risk. And some people aren't even in the office yet, right? We're ready, we're going, um, and we're, we were ready to put the bid in. Am I right that you hatched the idea for diameter on cocktail napkins at Bobby's restaurant down in Tribeca? A lot of what builds a successful partnership, whether it's uh, a marriage, a business partnership, et cetera, is you know, that the two people like each other, trust each other, and believe that they can learn from each other. And Scott and I, after I left Anchorage in 2013 to go to Centerbridge, we missed each other, right? Uh, I really missed his, his intensity, uh, the way he pushes me out of complacency, and his market knowledge. Um, and I, in fact, I used to call back to Anchorage using a code name because he couldn't have my name called across the desk uh, to uh, be able to talk to Scott during the day. Um, and yes, we live near each other in Lower Manhattan and uh, together, sometimes with other people, some who you know, lead big, big, big parts of banks, um, we would get together for those breakfasts at Bubby's. We had the deck in 2012, 2013, the beginnings names. of the deck. And we had talked to Cedars uh, back then. So when we were ready to go, it was pretty seamless to, to sort of restart those conversations. We've done a lot of things wrong, we've made a lot of mistakes, and we've changed some things. But the very general basic of the strategy and what we do is exactly the same as we thought it would be in Bubbies. So the first step was? Hedge fund. Hedge fund. Second step? Dislocation fund. After that? CDOs. And now we've just launched a CLO business. So put this all together. Hedge fund, drawdown fund, CDOs, CLOs, whatever else you get into. What are you three years so the, from now, I mean, five years from now? Hedge fund, five to seven billion. CDOs, a billion to a billion five. Because that, that, there's a cannibalization effect there with the hedge fund, so we size constrain that business. CLOs in the US, eight to 10. CLOs in the US, in, the, in Europe, sorry, maybe two to three. Um, structured credit, long only business potentially, that's a couple billion. Um, and then we think about what's happening in, in markets and we want to adapt our business. Uh, and we think that eventually private credit's a business that we'll be in. I'm not going to put a size on it. Um, but we see what the private equity guys are doing. We see we're getting more and more calls from them, especially on second liens, where we've worked a lot with Tama Bravo, uh, for instance, to originate a second lien paper with them. Um, we think that there's a real convergence in the credit space that we focus on, not the really small cap stuff, but mid and large cap, where we'll have an opportunity to be in that business as a complementary business to what we're doing elsewhere. If I add all those numbers up together, it's big. I get to north of 20, maybe 25. Yeah. 30, maybe, yeah. We'll see. But you know, you're only as good as your last trade. We got to keep making money in our core products first, and the other stuff will, will come Four along. Four and a half years ago, we were in a windowless room. We remember that every single day. Have you thought out a strategy yet for private credit? Whether we do it in a small scale or a large scale, we're still discussing, but it's a business that you'll see us in over the next few years because it's really synergistic with what we're doing, and we want to provide those capital solutions when issuers, companies come to us, and they say, well, we want a private and a public solution. We want to be able to provide that, whether it's working with the banks or working with the private equity sponsors that we, we do a lot of business And we with. want to know more names. And so uh, it's not something that was on the page, though, to your point. Five years ago in Bubbies, we wouldn't, we're not thinking that way. The market is changing. That dynamic is changing. CLOs are growing like crazy, so there's, you know, people need public paper, too. But um, that's why we're thinking about it. You have to adapt. You have to be nimble. 
And the market's telling us right now that that's a business that we eventually need to be in. I want to ask you about regulatory issues. Uh, Gary Gensler, the SEC chairman, is turning his withering gaze on corporate bond trading. He told senators he wants more efficiency and he wants more transparency in what historically has been an illiquid and opaque market. What could he do? That to make the credit market look a lot more like the equity market uh, would be a massive, massive overhaul. Doesn't mean that you can't do things to bring it closer and to protect investors who are today not being appropriately protected to the extent that exists. But I think it also highlights a really important difference. Scott mentioned earlier, credit investors are generally rule-based investors. You're looking at uh, what's the rating, uh, what's the industry, what's the geography. And certainly there are rules-based investors in equities to some degree. But it's such a different product. Equity markets forcing you to think so much forward-looking, whereas credit markets oftentimes are thinking, what were the last 12 months' earnings? Um, that there are probably really good ways to reform credit, many of which we haven't even thought of, that don't necessarily say, just copy what you see in equities. You go long and short in the hedge fund. Mm -hmm. Do you think of shorting as a hedge or a source of alpha? Shorting is controversial. Uh, my dad was an equity research analyst, uh, and he used to say to me that shorting is un-American um, <laughs> to some degree. Uh, he, he's an investor in the hedge fund now, so maybe he's come around. But uh, we really believe that so much time, so much on television, is thinking about uh, who are the winners? Right? Who's going to be have the best payment app? Who's going to have the best electronic vehicle? Um, and a big part of what we offer investors in thinking about shorting is sometimes finding the losers is easier uh, and finding them before it happens in capital structures that are hard to move around. Um, and so we really think that building our business to think about where is their technological transformation? Where is their policy volatility? And where is there a lot of debt? You know, first it was oil and gas led in terms of debt. Then healthcare led in terms of debt. Now I think it's technology that learns in terms of issuance. Um, basing our business around that to learn those companies not only produces a return shorting, but we turn around a lot of times and then buy them later when they're at a lower dollar price and help fix the businesses or work with people to fix the business. We've had too many shorts the past year. It's certainly been a drag on our returns. Our drawdown fund, which is long only, has done much better than our hedge fund. Um, but we're starting to see price volatility come, come back. And you know maturities change things. So there are certain sectors we think like Airlines have been zombified by, uh, by what's happened over the past year with all the bailouts there. Um, and some of those capital structures over time will have problems. There's no, nothing obvious right now. Um, but you have to, when you're shorting, what are you playing for? Are you playing for a downgrade? Earnings miss? A default? Right? You have to know what you're playing for and size your position to be able to trade it accordingly. But right now you're not playing for a lot of defaults. And we don't have a ton of shorts right now and they're very concentrated in the industries and sectors that we think have been you know, more zombified by COVID. You believe in shorting. It's part of the capital market, right? Yeah, sure. Do you worry at all that the meme stock vigilantes <laughs> could turn on credit players like the amateur and make you pay a Melvin-like price for having negative views? It, it was something that no one thought was going, could happen. It happened. And so we've now thought about it deeply and are more worried than we were. What are some of the big themes informing and underlying mm -hmm. your trades right now? The world is dealing with huge questions, but they're much longer term with a much broader array of outcomes. We're now learning that COVID is probably going to be something that is going to be with us in some form. We're learning that the vaccine efficacy changes over time and you may need boosters or not. We are seeing that uh, China is upsetting a lot of the expectation in markets as it changes some of its approach from economics to politics. We're seeing our politics at home. We may have a rerun of the 2020 election in 2024. And we have a central bank that has been really arguing since June to think about quantitative easing and rates and inflation differently. The problem is you don't get quick answers. Last year was unique. We got quick answers. All of those play out over 18 to 24 months. And I didn't even mention the fact that what happens to stimulus that the market is really addicted to if, for example, the control of the Senate changes in 2022. So what, we're, what we think that leads to is a more tactical market, harder to sit there and say, I believe this. Also, two years of COVID, you know, there may never be a new normal in terms of work from home and business travel. And so we're spending a lot of our time you know, looking at economic data. We're not macro traders or investors, but everything we do starts in what is the macro of the economy? What is the macro of the industry? What do we think about different types of consumers? How is spending going to change? Where is pricing going to really affect? And a lot of the themes we're focused on are 
how much of the inflation in goods is transitory versus real. We think generally that over time, supply chains work themselves out, but that services inflation is much harder to give back because once you've raised wages, it's harder to go back. And so some of those themes, which we then apply to airline industries like airlines and commercial real estate and hotels, where we see paper available and see some distressed, that's how we go from that 30,000 foot macro down to the company, but it always has to start with a view on the economy. Many in the markets are terrified by the prospect of a taper tantrum. Are you? Oh, I'd love it. I mean, we might <laughs> lose money at the beginning of it, but we have our watch list, we have our process, each analyst is ready. Um, we're disappointed there hasn't been one yet. Uh, and I think that that would be a great opportunity for us. Because? Because well, what, the, what we'd rather do than do distressed or grind out returns in, in Netflix, getting upgraded, frankly, is buy really good performing risk at a discount to par. And Taper Tantrums 2013 created an opportunity like that. It was, it was there for maybe three to four weeks and it was gone. Um, we really like those opportunities. You had a loan market type tantrum when the Fed changed its policy at the end of 2018. Loans went down five points. We put 15% of the loan fund in loans in like two weeks. So we're, we'd be excited for that opportunity set. But again, like, people have been predicting that all year and it hasn't happened. So positioning for it, are you gonna be positioned exactly right for it? No. No. And then you have to be able to change. So what does being able to change mean? We better run a low gross right now, which we are. And our gross is close to as low as it's been. Um, we don't run a lot of gross because we have more trading velocity, and especially periods like now. Um, we're sitting and being more patient. We're not patient people, but now it's kind of a time for patience. Uh, let me, Scott's excitement jumping off the page there goes a little bit to where we're different. So if you think about a taper tantrum, you're saying high quality bonds trade down. They don't go to distress levels. They go from par to 90, from 98 to 88. That would be an environment where big distressed guys would not be interested yet because these companies aren't defaulting. They're down for technical reasons. And they would look at the yield and they say, well, this doesn't hit my yield bogey. Whereas performing credit people might be having outflows because the retail market might react and say, oh, wow, bonds are going down. I want out. There are not a lot of, we've set up the firm to be at that intersection, to be able to buy the highest quality stuff when it's down. And that's represented by a taper tantrum. You've committed to not invest in thermal coal, guns, and tobacco. Yeah, no longs. Why? I mean, we're trying to respond to our investor base, which is frankly, I think, ahead of the curve uh, versus the hedge fund industry on ESG. And we've got some really thoughtful investors that we're working with, not only in the hedge fund and the drawdown fund, but in our CLOs, which have an even more stringent ESG policy so far than the hedge fund does. Um, we don't think that we should be supporting and financing companies that have negative long-term impacts on society. And ESG is really interesting um, because it's probably going to be something that changes cost of capital for companies for the next 10 years. It's going to be a huge changer of cost of capital. We'd love to say this is just driven by our moral ideals. Um, it plays a role. But as Scott pointed out, the market is no longer going to provide capital to restructure these businesses. The number of regular way investors, particularly investors higher up in capital structures who don't want to take a lot of risk, they want to be able to say, I'm not taking a lot of risk, I don't have a lot of return, so God help me if I'm helping a company that's destroying the environment or doing bad things to people. So we think that we're getting a little bit, trying to get a little ahead and saying, not only do we want to do the right thing, but the cost of capital is going to change dramatically for these businesses and don't think about your old valuations when you think about some of these dirty companies. And we're going to have to make our money shorting them because we're not going to be investing in the distressed when they go distressed. But you're in the money making business, right? As the cost of capital rises, the return to the investor in that issue, it whether it be rising. equity or whether if it keeps rising, ah. right? Keeps getting worse. A lot of the thermal coal in many ways, you know, people, people tried. They said, oh, wow, look how cheap this is. Right? And then they realize there's just a whole generation of people who don't want anything to do with it. You're going through in Europe a little bit of an issue with power right now. And, and you know, coal plants are slated to close in the UK. And you don't see a huge upbringing saying, what are we doing? The world has moved on a little bit. You, you can assume maybe that the cost of capital might change and go back down for some businesses. But for others, we think it's in exact, a rise upward. Do you think that the impact of the embrace of ESG becomes so powerful that it actually makes some businesses unviable? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There'll they'll, 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 they'll be family offices. I'm thinking strictly from a cost of capital basis. Yes, like it's just I, I absolutely think, expensive to I be in business. I think there'll be only family offices that will finance certain businesses. Institutions will not finance them. 
which means that they're a set, that market has to be tiny. So mountaintop mining writ large. Yep. They'll find a family office that wants to own the cash flows, but no institutional financing. And not a lot of family offices. Yeah. It, it's, the world is really changing in terms of how flows of capital move, and there's consensus around certain industries. And the challenge for all of us, and we're fiduciaries of capital, for people with many different political views, um, the challenge for us is to understand a little bit how that consensus changes um, and how different industries get caught up in it um, or are able to demonstrate that they actually have a responsible approach. Why grow the business? Why become a top 10, 15, top 20 CLO issuer? Mm. Why target $30 billion in AUM? We'll, we're both really competitive people. Um, I'm probably amongst the most competitive people you've met, you know, playing either sports or fantasy sports or things like that as I got into to growing up as a, as a kid. Um, I'm just very, very competitive, like the investing side of it. And we want to be a capital solution for all the companies we engage with. And right now, you know, we're now missing a leg of the stool, which is the private credit leg. And we have the CLO leg, which is really important, but that complements with the private credit leg that we're missing. So it's less about the AUM, more about building a business that we think can provide all those solutions. Your co-founders, mm -hmm. your co-managing partners, you're the happily married couple, <laughs> right? Jointly and severally responsible for the success or the failure of this family. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask you the Sophie's Choice question. <laughs> Which of you could Diameter least afford to lose? Huh. Uh, Neither I, uh, is the answer. I think we both make each other better. Um, you know, we both have different skill sets. I think my skills are more replicable than his. Um, what makes Scott so special is that he uh, knows the technicals of every market, but he thinks first about the industry and the company. That just doesn't exist in a lot of people, that combination of wanting to know the business, wanting to start with the industry, but also knowing all those technicals. Um, so uh, look, I, I, we, we both think we're good at what we do. I don't think there is a, a lack of ego at the top of this firm. Um, but uh, what makes it work is that it's a complementary skill set when everyone always wants to know what happens when you disagree. It's literally the, the number one yeah. question we get. And the answer is, we certainly disagree, but we always know the basis of the disagreement. That's the same answer, actually, that he gives the investors. So that's a pretty good answer. Yeah. You got that publicly. Yeah. <laughs> um, recently, I heard a quote that I quite like on a Tiger Global conference call. We're humble and hungry, and we know we could screw this up before lunch. <laughs> How could you screw this up? I think size constraint in the hedge fund is a focus. Um, growing in a measured fashion, and some people might say we're growing too fast now, we think we're growing to what the opportunity set is. Doing it without the right size of team, um, that's one thing we were really focused on, having the right size team to do the CLO business. We added a lot of additional resources to do that. Um, and then our, our relationship between the two of us, right? I mean, that's something where we have that built-in, uh, basically, fail-safe switch with our, our coach that we meet with together uh, every couple of weeks, and she meets with the whole team each quarter to try to figure out if there are any issues brewing that we need to nip Where in the bud. I think complacency in politics. So it's very easy to get complacent, particularly when you've had a little success. And you know, we're happy with things so far, but it's, a, it's been almost no time. Uh, and when you, this is a very hard industry. Everyone is smart. Everyone has a Bloomberg terminal. Everyone can calculate EBITDA. All right? And once you get a little complacent, someone else is going to eat your lunch. And yeah. we have found and we think that complacency totally comes agree. into organizations when there's too much politics. When you have people who have titles that aren't like, act, like descriptive, you know, I'm the senior managing director for the Dakotas and for consumer products, right? That was done just to keep the guy a little happy, but it messes up the politics. And you know, we've spent a lot of time talking to our team about what career advancement means here. And we found you know, we found real leadership opportunities in, in our CLO business, in our structured credit for people on the team. But over time, you can't mess up what you have in politics. And maybe you have to help people figure out to run their own firm. Uh, and I don't think enough hedge funds think that way. And so complacency and politics are together. If we avoid those, we have a better chance of not messing up. But this is so hard every day. At some point, we'll stub our toe.